Tonight, a drastic change in advice about what's a safe amount of alcohol to drink. I think that women in large part were not aware of the inherent increased risk of breast cancer. The dramatically reduced suggestion for your weekly intake. Also tonight, community reaction to scenes of dangerous driving and acts of violence. All of a sudden I'm looking out and the gentleman's jumping and he smashes the front windshield of the police cruiser. Let's go, Serena! And fans line up to say thank you and farewell to tennis legend Serena Williams. This is The National. Good evening, I'm David Common. Adrian is away. For years, Canadians have been told a glass of wine with dinner or a couple of beers with friends are low risk. But that message is expected to change dramatically. These are the current guidelines. 15 drinks at most for men, 10 for women per week. But a new report from the scientific body that advises the government on alcohol consumption suggests the new recommendation should be two. Two drinks a week, maximum. As Joanna Romeliotis explains, the report and the science behind it are clear. Alcohol is a carcinogen, potentially a killer. And what many now consider a safe amount isn't. Sure. You might want to put down your drink to hear this. No amount of alcohol is safe. Your risks start to increase at one standard drink per week. And really, our main message is that less is better. A new report from the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction says the science has evolved and so must the guidance. Low risk is now defined as two or fewer standard drinks a week. Any more than that and the risks start climbing fast. Three to five drinks a week increases the risk of developing certain cancers. More than seven drinks a week also increases your risk of heart disease and stroke. The danger goes up with every additional drink. Overall, it's not good for your health. As for any health benefits, the report found none. You know, one of the reasons why previously um, the guidelines were higher is that there was this uh, conception that alcohol had some benefits um, with regards to some cardiovascular diseases. More recent studies now find that that is probably not the case. The new proposed recommendations are a sobering shift from Canada's 2011 guidelines, which recommend no more than 15 drinks a week for men and 10 drinks a week for women. Many Canadians drink more than that, unaware of the health risks, especially for women, whose risk of developing breast cancer goes up with just three drinks a week. I think that this is going to save a lot of lives. Ali Garber's mom and grandmother had breast cancer. She found out about the link after she quit drinking. I think that women in large part were not aware of the inherent increased risk of breast cancer that came with a certain amount of, of alcohol consumption. I know I was floored when I learned about it. Some public health authorities have already started warning people about the cancer risk. And more education is key, the report says, including labeling how many drinks are in alcohol containers. But cancer specialists want even more, including cancer warning labels like these that were piloted in Yukon liquor stores in 2017. There's also evidence if you change the warning a little bit, you can increase awareness. So the more you drink, the more cancer you get. Like, that's, that's the bottom line. You know, the warnings from this report seem clear enough. So when does it become official? It's expected to become official, David, after a final report is submitted to the federal government in November. Right now begins a period of consultation so that health policy experts and even members of the public can weigh in. It's worth noting, David, that the scientists behind this report say they've reviewed nearly 6,000 studies and the new proposed guidelines, they say, simply align to the overwhelming amount of evidence out there that says no amount of alcohol is safe. Mm. Joanna Romeliotis, thank you. A Toronto area restaurant has been shut down and an investigation launched after a suspected food poisoning. Several people are said to be in hospital after becoming seriously ill. Thomas Dagg on what we know. A popular restaurant abruptly shut down by public health. What happened here, sending multiple diners to hospital, is so far a mystery. It's hard to believe you know what it is. And it just opened. I brought my little boy here, he's two, and everything was fine. 
public health officials are investigating after they say several individuals became seriously ill following a meal at Delight Restaurant and Barbecue. A Toronto critical care specialist tweeted, a notice has been circulating about this poisoning event, which has apparently affected multiple patients sent to different hospitals. This man came and ate here with his family Sunday night. I guess I got to wait and I'm just watching my son if he's going to be sick. Delight Restaurant and Barbecue displays a health inspection certificate from May, but no notice about why it's now closed. This expert spoke to doctors who've treated some patients after they ate a chicken dish. Some of the patients became quite sick with uh, irregularities of their heartbeat, uh, including at least one patient who required intensive care. He says the symptoms are consistent with a poisoning involving aconite, a plant used in ancient Chinese medicine, but so dangerous it's nicknamed the queen of poisons. Public health says the restaurant is cooperating with the investigation, and in the meantime, officials are telling anyone with leftovers at home to throw them out. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Markham, Ontario. We are learning more details about a horrific weekend car crash that took the lives of six young people in Barrie, Ontario. That's about an hour north of Toronto. All are believed to have been in their 20s. The road they were on has been closed for months for construction. Ali Chiasson brings us the latest on the investigation and a grieving community. Flowers are piling up and mourners continue to stop by at this country road crash site. It happened sometime between Saturday night and Sunday morning. An impact so severe it killed all six young men and women inside. Their friends say that after an evening out altogether, they lost touch with the six around one o'clock in the morning. When they didn't come home, their families reported them missing. Barry police found all six friends at two o'clock in the morning, their car wrecked at this construction site along the road. Locals tell me this road is a popular shortcut, but it's been closed since the spring for sewer construction. And that explains the large pit in the road that the car appears to have crashed into. It also explains why the Ministry of Labour is on site as well. The victims are Luke West, Curtis King, River Wells, Haley Marin, Jersey Mitchell and Jason O'Connor, all in their early 20s. Curtis was full of life and uh, always willing to help anyone, everyone, and uh, yeah, 100%. I just ask everyone, please give all of the affected families some, some time to, to grieve, and um, yeah, just, just be respectful, just give us some space. Some family members are just being escorted back from the construction pit where the car fell into. They were escorted here by police. You can imagine how difficult this must be for them, but it also speaks to how desperate they are for answers. The investigation into this crash is expected to take some time. Police will be looking at whether intoxication, speed, or possibly poor visibility around the construction site on the closed road could have led to this. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Barrie, Ontario. It is not what residents of a popular Ontario beach destination wanted this weekend. Street racing, stunt driving, police cars smashed. Just a few of the crimes now under investigation after an unsanctioned car rally. Greg Ross looks at the community's reaction. This video posted to social media shows the massive party that took over the streets of Wasega Beach Saturday night and into Sunday morning. They were smoking their tires, doing little quick drags up and down the street here on Main Street behind us over here. This woman says the people involved went too far. It was just one continuous noise after another, constant for hours and hours. But that wasn't even the worst of it. She also saw the crowd turn on police as they tried to break things up. And all of a sudden I hear this commotion and I'm looking out and I see this guy. I didn't see him getting on it, but all of a sudden I'm looking out and the gentleman's jumping and he smashes the front windshield of the police cruiser. Police say there were two cruisers damaged while officers and even a police dog were still inside the vehicles. Thankfully, no injuries to the officers or uh, the canine as well. However, uh, the safety of our officers was compromised. Police say a number of businesses were damaged over the weekend, including this Walmart. In addition to stunt driving in the parking lot, police say a group of people 
tried to break into the store. We are presently investigating uh, numerous uh, different incidents of mischief, uh, Highway Traffic Act uh, offenses as well. Wasega Beach Mayor Nina Bifalici is questioning why the OPP didn't have more resources on hand this weekend. In a statement, she said there were many examples brought to the attention of the town where laws were being broken and police intervention was not witnessed. This is unacceptable to the residents of Wasega Beach. <laughs> Some residents say it's lucky nobody was seriously injured. Especially when they're ripping up and down the street like that and people are standing in the middle of the street, someone's going to get hurt. We just don't want to see that here. I mean, it's, it's all well and good if you want to have fun, but do it safely. There were a number of arrests made this weekend and police expect many more to come. The OPP are reviewing videos posted to social media as well as surveillance video hoping to identify those responsible. Greg Ross, CBC News, Wasega Beach. The federal government says it's making progress addressing those frustrating wait times at airports, passport offices and for immigration applications while acknowledging there's still a lot more to be done. We are not by, not by no stretch of the imagination out of the woods yet. Uh, the focus will continue to be on Canadians and the results they expect and deserve. In that update, the task force created to improve service delays say hundreds of additional staff have been added at airports as well as visa and immigration offices. While accepting responsibility for the backlog, they say the sudden demand for services far exceeded the government's capacity to respond. Those backlogs are also holding up international students. As Paige Parsons explains, some are still waiting on visas with the start of classes just days away. Dreams on hold. Delays in processing student visas mean many international students hoping to start classes at Canadian universities and colleges this fall are instead stuck in their home countries. I'm pretty sad about it, to be really honest, because all my plans for this particular year got like, slashed out in a, in a heartbeat. Tuition is much higher for international students than it is for Canadians. Even if they defer classes, they're required to pay tens of thousands of dollars up front. So that's how it is. But the loan which I took and the interest which I have to pay on it is something which is uh, demanding right now. Before the pandemic, we used to get the decisions in week, one week, two weeks. And in many instances, we actually used to get them within 48 to 72 hours. But now it's taking four to six months. This international student recruiter says he has more than 100 clients in India whose study plans have been disrupted by delays. Global talent and field. The federal government says they are doing everything they can. We expect that we're going to uh, process a little more than 104,000 additional study permits. Uh, there has been an absolute uh, explosion in demand uh, when it comes to Canada's international student program in recent years. Ottawa's task force, made up of 10 federal ministers, says it's also making progress on issues from immigration to passport wait times to airport chaos. The delays we've been seeing at airports are frustratingly unacceptable. I also want to be clear that we won't stop working until this issue is resolved. According to flight tracking company FlightAware, Toronto and Montreal's main airports have been the worst in the world this year when it comes to flight delays. But El Gabra says things have improved significantly over the last month, with numbers moving closer to pre-pandemic levels. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Ottawa. Canada's public safety minister says the growing online hate towards public figures in Canada is a threat to the country's democracy. This comes as female journalists, particularly journalists of color, speak out about the harassment they face. Ashley Burke shows us how online threats spill over into the real world. Christia, yes. what the f*** are you doing in Alberta? This abuse hurled at the Deputy Prime Minister the latest escalation of threats and intimidation against women in public life, including those who report on it. It's different from just hate mail. Because I get hate mail. I've gotten hate mail a lot. Erica Eiffel is part of a group of targeted Canadian journalists speaking out for weeks. We've been receiving hate mail as part of a coordinated, targeted effort at what I call psychological warfare. The anonymous email started a month ago. The messages are racist, misogynist and sexually violent. The death threats personal. These repeated attempts at you know, destabilizing us, I would say, are more insidious. They include um, details about our past work. 
They t their death threats, gang rape threats. Threats that Eiffel says police didn't take seriously. Minister Marcy Ian, a former journalist herself targeted before, said it's time for everyone to stand up against this. The level of threats that I got as a black journalist, the level of threats that I got on my life and the life of my children uh, to run for office was not a small decision to make. Uh, this is real. This is real. The Liberal government previously introduced legislation to address online harm, but it was highly criticized for focusing on taking down online content, which could harm freedom of speech. Now it's back in consultations. And so that it um, ensures that, that people can have robust free speech uh, in all fora, including online, uh, but that we also uh, delineate some, some clear boundaries. Eiffel says the messages are an attempt to silence her but she's not backing down. And it's not like they're going to shut us up either. Like, I got into this because I didn't want to be shut up anymore. So, Ashley, you mentioned the government's working on updated legislation. What exactly is different this time around? Well, David, we spoke to a leading expert on cybersecurity law, and she says it's clear there needs to be government oversight, but the thinking has changed. Now the focus is on potentially flagging and limiting the ability to amplify content rather than taking it down. And the big question is, what would be the scope of any new legislation, and would it protect public figures, including journalists, from threatening emails? All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you very much. Today, the Prime Minister joined residential school survivors at a special ceremony to raise the survivor's flag at Parliament Hill. This flag is an expression of remembrance. It is meant to honor all survivors. There aren't very many of us left, maybe 30,000 max. Take an opportunity to meet us, know who we are. Survivors from across the country helped design that flag and it will fly at Parliament Hill until 2024 when it will then be moved to a permanent home. Francois Legault's CAQ party is seen to be in a strong position as Quebec's election campaign gets underway. But not all Quebecers feel heard by the incumbents. Alison Northcott looks at how some are now weighing their options. Fresh election signs in Montreal and a range of issues for voters to consider. The environment is the top priority because I think that our government is not doing enough. I would say education and health care uh, most of the time. You know, I just come from the grocery store. It's very, very expensive. It's tough. The economy was the focus for CAQ leader Francois Legault on the second day of the campaign, promising tax cuts and more money in people's pockets. The income taxes are higher in Quebec than about anywhere else in North America. It's important to become more competitive. His party may be far ahead in the polls, but a crowded field of opponents is trying to change that. The left-leaning Quebec Solidaire wants to position itself as the CAQ's main opposition. While the sovereignist Parti Québécois hopes to come back from the brink and avoid losing more ground. The economy being the ballot question. Quebec Liberal Party leader Dominique Anglade has struggled for recognition, and the Anglophone and Allophone voters her Federalist Party could once count on are no sure bet as the dynamic shifts in Quebec away from the debate around sovereignty. Some of these voters could decide to, you know, traditional Liberal voters decide just not to show up to vote because they think that they know the outcome of the election or they are not so enthusiastic about Dominique Anglade. This political analyst says some are disappointed the Liberals didn't take a stronger stance against the CAQ's French language law, Bill 96, which left some Anglophones feeling their rights are under threat. I, I just feel like uh, we've been stepped on. Every single time is a new regulation, new regulation, new regulation. Other parties are trying to take advantage of that discontent. They're always promising, but they're never delivering. Like the Conservative Party of Quebec, a non-factor in previous elections now aiming for Liberal and CAQ seats in a campaign that has several more weeks to play out. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Turning now to the political race playing out in Alberta, tomorrow is the final debate featuring contenders for the United Conservative Party leadership. The winner of the race will become the province's next premier. Aaron Collins with the details. 
At this Southern Alberta diner, politics is served up hot. Diners happy to dish on the race to lead the UCP and perceived frontrunner Danielle Smith. Scary. That's scary to me, to be honest. Like I say, I think she has some really far out agendas and things. Ideas like Smith's flirtation with Alberta independence, popular with many in the UCP base, less so here. Not having the security of being part of Canada and the possibility of sovereignty will drive away investment and will be detrimental to the province. But it isn't hard to find those that support Smith. Conservative Albertans frustrated with Ottawa's handling of everything from COVID to carbon taxes, ready to embrace sovereignty. Yeah, I think it's. I think it would be great. I'd like my own little piece of land that I, that is just mine and I have control over. Um, so yeah, it would be awesome. Smith is trying to appeal to the right flank of Alberta's conservative movement. Those voters seen as key to winning the leadership and the premiership. Well, it seems to be working, a fact that's dragged the other leadership candidates to the right too. But political watchers say the voters needed to win the UCP leadership may not be the ones needed to win a general election. The PCs were all about consensus. They were always about trying to find the middle ground. Um, now the United Conservative Party is about giving control to the most extreme grassroots aspects of the party. And there are worries from inside the province's business community about the impact of the saber rattling over Alberta's sovereignty. To be at war with the federal government and think that this is going to get us further economically is really uh, a very naive perspective. The back at that diner, an appetite for political stability. I don't know, I just think the whole province is in a mess right now. We need a strong leader, but we need somebody that's going to work to unite the province. Something that may not be on the political menu in Alberta these days. Aaron Collins, CBC News, High River, Alberta. NASA's new mission to the moon is on hold tonight. We don't launch until it's right. Why today's launch was called off and what could happen next? It's so dangerous, it's so complicated. Plus, will more countries follow Estonia in banning Russian tourists? I think that gives out like a clear signal to Russia. The greatest of all time. And as Serena Williams takes to the court at the US Open, tributes from fans and fellow athletes. I always think uh, Serena's transcended our sport. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. NASA had hoped to celebrate its latest triumph in space tonight. Instead, it's scrambling to get the Artemis 1 mission back on track after technical problems scrubbed this morning's launch. Here's Jayla Bernstein on what went wrong and the race now to fix it. Artemis launch control. The excitement of launch day ultimately fizzled into an all systems no. You don't want to light the candle until it's ready to go. If tricky weather and lightning strikes in recent days weren't enough, last minute issues sprang up with one of the rocket's four engines. The team was tired at the end of the day and we just decided that it was the best to knock it off. Each launch costs an estimated four billion U.S. dollars. The price tag of the entire Artemis mission, 93 billion. The end goal is to send humans to the moon and set up bases for long-term exploration. But the first step is a trial run. The next window to launch an uncrewed test flight is Friday. We're not ready to give up yet. At a viewing party at the Edmonton Science Centre, the cancellation left astronomy fans feeling a bit let down. Kind of disappointing, but that's okay. This is really the first big, big mission by NASA since who knows when. Half a century, in fact. 1972 was the last time humans walked on the moon. More powerful than the Saturn V used during the Apollo years, the Artemis rocket is the most complex ever built. That's why engineers want to iron out all the issues without humans on board. We're used to these delays in, the, in, this, in this business because it's so dangerous, it's so complicated. He speaks from experience. David Saint-Jacques spent 204 days on the International Space Station. The little boy in me is disappointed. I wanted to see the excitement of a rocket launch, this great new rocket, the beginning of a new era of exploration, back to the moon, ultimately eventually to Mars. But the sober engineer in me, guys, whew, 
glad that someone found that problem. Better to work out the kinks now before astronauts climb aboard. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Pakistan's climate minister says a third of the country is submerged by water. <laughs> Flooding has killed more than a thousand people in the country since monsoon season began in June. Tens of thousands fled their homes this weekend after a fast rising river destroyed a bridge. Canada is giving Pakistan $5 million in humanitarian aid. The Ukrainian military has confirmed it has launched offensive operations in the south of the country. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky told occupying Russians to flee if they want to survive. Anyone who wants to know what our plans are, you won't hear specifics, Zelensky said in his evening address. But he continued... We will pursue Russian occupiers right to Ukraine's borders. Ukraine has been openly preparing for a major counteroffensive in the south for weeks. Russians are now finding themselves unwelcome beyond Ukraine's borders. As Breyer Stewart explains, Estonia is banning Russian tourists and it wants that to become policy across Europe. The pomp of a Russian flag raising ceremony. A spectacle even for those living just across the river in Estonia. Russia, Most living here are like Natalia Lagutina, Russian speaking with close family living across the border. I don't believe Putin was the first to start the war. Don't believe it, she says. This former Soviet Republic is connected to Russia by the now ironically named Friendship Bridge. So yeah. where exactly is the border? The border is in this red point on the grey fence. About 5,000 people cross every day, but Russians holding Estonian tourist visas won't be allowed through unless they're exempted for humanitarian reasons. Estonian officials think this ban will affect about 50,000 people, but they want to prevent more Russians from coming over this bridge. They want to turn anyone away with the Schengen area visa, and they're calling for other European countries to get on board. The Baltic countries and Finland support the move, but other nations don't, saying a ban unfairly punishes ordinary Russians. Estonia's foreign minister doesn't buy that. We have to, uh, to, to have to also give a strong push to the Russian society to wake up. You can't just walk on the streets of Moscow, Moscow or St. Petersburg or Berlin uh, mm, uh, as a tourist, just uh, eyes wide shut. On the streets of Estonia's capital, many feel the same. Nothing will happen until people themselves stand up and, and make their voice heard. Yeah, I think that gives out like a clear signal to Russia that the things they're doing are not okay. Back on the border, it's not surprising we didn't find anyone who supports the ban. This is like Soviet times when there was an iron curtain, he said. <laughs> Valentina Plakova is Russian but lives in Estonia. She crosses the border to buy crosswords. <laughs> We're always being blamed. As the former emperor once said, Russia has two friends, the army and the navy. That friendship bridge could soon have a lot less traffic because Estonia is promising to move forward with a wider ban even if the rest of the EU doesn't agree. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Narva, Estonia. Up next, a real estate deal being offered in Toronto that's raising some eyebrows. That's just too good to be true. It involves big discounts and some big questions too. A CBC News investigation right after the break. And the moment a Canadian woman reached new heights and set a new record. A months long CBC Toronto investigation has revealed details of a real estate deal seemingly aimed at members of the local black community. Million dollar plus homes at steep discounts, low down payments, and cheap private mortgages. Ryan Patrick Jones looks at why some are now speaking out. It's a sprawling suburban development, one of several that longtime developer Paradise Developments is building around the GTA. 
But for the past year and a half, a new company with an almost identical name has allegedly been selling the developers' homes, promising much lower prices and special financing. The deals caught the eye of realtor Horace Dockery. They were just throwing everything at you to say, hey, buy this 5% down, we're going to give you financing, no questions asked, and we're going to sell it 30% below market value. That's just too good to be true. The red flags prompted him to post a warning on social media for members of the black community interested in real estate. He alleged a group of men were using Paradise's name, but getting buyers to pay deposits to the similarly named company, Paradise Development Homes Limited, or PDHL. The clientele that were deeply affected were predominantly from the black community, and that was alarming. Um, and I realized also there was a subsect of black community which was highly religious people. According to a PDHL purchase agreement we obtained, buyers were told they can't contact the developer, can't share details of their purchases, and the paragraph about getting legal advice is crossed out. CBC Toronto spoke with more than 10 people, the majority of them black, who say they either gave deposits to individuals connected with PDHL, have friends or family members who made payments, or who heard the pitch but didn't invest. Paradise Developments, the builder, says it has no connection with its namesake, PDHL. So who's behind this mysterious company, one that we found isn't licensed to build or sell homes in Ontario? Corporate records show PDHL's first director was a man named Hassan Zafar. Zafar didn't respond to emailed questions, phone calls or attempts to contact him at his Etobicoke home. CBC News has learned Zafar later registered a second company under the same name and listed Milton resident Conan J. Hamdani as director. Hamdani has a lengthy criminal record and in June, at an unrelated plea hearing, a judge called him a career fraudster. He claimed to know nothing about the company when we reached him by phone. I don't own the company. I've never registered this company and I have to figure out what's going on. Multiple people who gave deposits to PDHL or know someone who has say they handed their money to this man, Moise Kunwar. We caught up with him outside his Brampton home. Tell us about your real estate dealings. I have no real estate. I got nothing to lie about. Okay. There's not, there's, it doesn't benefit me in any way whatsoever. I'm, I'm a civilized guy. I live a civilized life. Weeks later, on the phone, Kunwar said he bought two homes himself and shared information about the deal with friends, but he denied taking deposits. I suddenly started getting calls, and I was like, bro, like, this is what I did. And this was his number, and you can go do it too. That's all I did, bro. Kunwar pointed to another individual, but CBC Toronto was unable to reach the person or verify their identity. Well, everything is red flagged right now, so I don't know. I don't know. Gurleen Cribb says she and her son handed Kunwar a deposit on a pre-construction paradise home in 2020. They were supposed to move in in March, but so far have no keys, no home, and no answers from Kunwar. What are you most concerned about? Um, my plan that I had, it's gone. So, yeah. The established developer, Paradise Developments, says it sent cease and desist letters to Zafar, Hamdani and Kunwar. In a statement to CBC Toronto, the company said Paradise Developments does not have a business relationship or any connection whatsoever to Paradise Development Homes Limited. The company says it's also notified police. Veteran mortgage broker Ron Butler says the province's housing market has made wannabe buyers increasingly desperate. I think the narrative and desire to own a home is so powerful in the GTA among so many people that they would grasp at a straw like this. Dockery believes unaffordable housing and a lack of access to financing may have made the black community a possible target and it's unfortunate and uh, there needs to be more awareness put out and uh, action by the authorities to stop this. Some buyers CBC Toronto spoke to say they still believe they'll get their homes. Others who heard about the deal question whether that will happen. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Toronto. All eyes are on Serena Williams tonight at the U.S. Open. The greatest of all time. We will take you next right to Arthur Ashe Stadium as fans say their farewells to a legend. Tennis legend Serena Williams has won her first match of the U.S. Open, what might be her final professional tournament. Chris Reyes talks to fans who've come to see the champion play, cheer her on, and maybe say goodbye. 
at this year's U.S. Open. For those who don't know, greatest of all time, the one and only Serena Williams. The love, the respect, the awe for Serena Williams. Let's go, Serena! Serena! Bursting at the seams. Her fans finding every nook and cranny just to catch a glimpse of her practicing. We think that she is not only the greatest of all times, we think she's unmatchable. She paid her dues and she's left a legacy for others to follow. All of them all too aware that this could be the last time. Don't make me cry. Yes, I'm very sad. I understand that it has to happen, but she has meant so much to us, so much to tennis, so much to young black girls. Earlier this month, Serena Williams announced she would be evolving away from tennis to focus on her family and her businesses. In Vogue magazine, she said, I don't want it to be over, but at the same time, I'm ready for what's next. Well, I always think uh, Serena's transcended our sport, um, gone way beyond the boundaries of just being an athlete uh, because of her stature, uh, using tennis as a platform. From no nowhere, the underdog coming through and becoming one of, if not the greatest female player ever. This U.S. Open likely her last tournament. Fitting, she won her first Grand Slam here in 1999 at just 17 years old. How could you not be inspired and happy looking at that? I wanted them to be inspired to just want to seek this type of feeling. For the younger generation of tennis players, Serena is more than an inspiration. She's the person who paved the way for their careers. Growing up, I never thought that I was different because, you know, the number one player in the world was somebody who looked like me. She has done so much for the sport, not only for tennis players, but for women in general. They, she's fought for us. She leaves the game with a legacy cemented, 23 grand slams, the most of any player in the open era, all from that humble beginning. In Serena's words, a story that started in Compton, California, with a little black girl who just wanted to play tennis. So, Chris, you're right there. How was the match? Yeah. Well, David, she won pretty easily in straight sets, did her famous twirl at the end. The full house was right behind her. It was a star-studded crowd, an outpouring of love and support. In fact, the whole stadium at the end spelled out, we love Serena. Oh, that's terrific. And now, what's next? Well, first things first, she has said that she wants to grow her family. Her daughter, Olympia, was in the crowd. She has said that she wants to give Olympia a sibling. She also wants to grow her businesses through Serena Ventures, investing in companies, especially those founded by women and women of color. That means a lot to her. So not the end of her story, just a brand new chapter. David? Absolutely. And not done yet there at the tournament either. Chris, thank you very much. Coming up next on The National, the animals left behind in Ukraine. Uh, more than 100 horses. 100 horses, mm -hmm. all coming more out than. of war. Yes, and it's not a finish. Lost and abandoned horses and the people working to comfort and save them. That is coming up after the break. The war in Ukraine is affecting every facet of life, from families to farms. Tonight, we revisit a story I told from Ukraine this spring. Refuge and compassion for horses that faced injuries, disease and starvation. And we were there to witness a remarkable reunion. War's impact can even be measured in Ukraine's stables. And how many have These horses, the all evacuees, pulled from areas of active fighting, many still terrified. I can tell you that they came from Kyiv region, uh, Sumska region, Dnipro region, Odessa. How many horses have you had? Now, 32. But uh, for all this time, we changed uh, more than 100 horses. 100 horses? Mm -hmm. All coming out of war. Yes. And it's not a finish. Larisa Kozlapenko is only temporarily caring for these animals. She doesn't know their names or who owns them, only that strangers found them and got them out. They'll now all be moved out of country by volunteers. Oh boy. Uh, he is sick now. Yeah. And uh, in this stable in which he lived, because of war, was nothing to eat, no personnel, so he he's very fashion. skinny. Yes, he's very, very skinny. skinny. Yeah. On arrival, he could barely walk. 
Oh, so the vet is giving medicine. Mm -hmm. In those first hours, there was an urgent need to add fluids intravenously. Spray antibiotics on burns and cuts on horses which fled fire and attacks. And every week, more come. As we're talking to Larissa, Yasya arrives with apples for horses and stories to tell about some of them. Turns out she knows many well. She rides competitively. These are show horses. She tells us she saw the horses had been moved on an Instagram page for rescues. That's when she decided to come and see them. She's able to tell rescuers their names and that they come from the hard-hit Donetsk region. It's an incredible reunion for her, but one that will be short-lived. They must leave the country for safety, and she cannot. Julia! This truck from Sweden will take them out to welfare groups abroad. It's also bringing needed food in too. They have donations, buy the hay, uh, buy this and uh, the food and bring to us. To keep the horses alive. Yes, yeah. yes, because without this I don't know what we will do. Mm -hmm. Larissa will say goodbye too, waiting for the next evacuees to suddenly show up, some injured in attacks. How do you feel about that with the horses? I want to cry. Because it's, it's difficult to imagine what they have uh, felt and uh, how they are. Oh. Another reminder that war's toll stretches wide, but so too does love and the desire to help. <laughs> David Common, CBC News, Volya Bartitivska, Ukraine. When we come back, climbing some of the world's highest peaks. Age is not the limit, it's just the number. Now, one Ontario woman climbed three of them and made some history along the way in our moment. This is Lilia Yanovskaya, now the oldest woman to climb the summit of the dangerous mountain K2. And that was just one of three 8,000 meter plus summits that she's reached all within a few weeks of each other. Her drive and accomplishment is our moment. I feel strong. I've been able to dream big. I just came back from Pakistan where I spent uh, almost two months. The major goal for this expedition was uh, climbing K2, which is the second highest mountain in the world. Two weeks after that, I decided I have something more in me and uh, I pushed myself in summit in Gashubrantu, which is another 8,000 meter peak in Pakistan. I feel amazing. <laughs> A month uh, basically before I went to Pakistan, Dasha and I, we went to Nepal and we summited the highest mountain. Went to the very top of the world, so we summited Everest together. I mean, sharing the moment at the top of the world, when we are both very short people. We were the tallest people in the world, <laughs> just for a little instant. <laughs> so we were able to accomplish that together. Age is not the limit, it's just the number. And you can definitely push through this barrier. Yeah, keep training, stay positive, set up the goals and just go for it. Pretty good. She's 62, didn't even start alpine climbing until she was 50 inspired by her kids to uh, undertake a new challenge, and she's not done, has plans to do more climbing this spring. And that is The National for August 29th. Have a great night.